Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, our Horasis Asia 2021 conversation, the eradication of COVID and the balancing of uh, key strategic initiatives like the United Nations uh, 17 key goals. Uh, we have with us today some phenomenal global thought leaders from around the world, and we're going to discuss the challenges uh, from their specific areas, concerns, and some practical examples. My name is Ted Waz. I'm the Vice President of the Board of Directors for the World Smart City Economic Development Commission of the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion and the World Business Angel Fund. Together, we lay out opportunities for more than 127 countries and 500 cities to be able to look into best practices, standards, and opportunities to learn from one another as they build smart and digital cities. And that covers everything from population health, to agriculture, to security, to privacy, to the economy. Today we have with us Kate and George, and hopefully Hind will join us in just a moment. But if I may, Kate, if you could give a brief introduction of your background and what you're going to be talking about today, and then George will follow up with you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for introduction. It's always a pleasure to be part of Harazi's conferences. My name is uh, Kate Butts. I'm a management partner at Deep Knowledge Group. Uh, I'm an attorney by background. I'm licensed actually in California, New York, but I have not been actively practicing uh, because I've been privileged to be uh, part of our uh, consortium of companies, uh, which encompasses both commercial and nonprofit organizations. Uh, we've been active since uh, approximately 2014 uh, on many fronts of Deep Tech. Our uh, main focus uh, originally has been and remains to be longevity, which is living healthier for longer uh, during the currently known human lifespan, but also been uh, active on other fronts such as uh, artificial intelligence, specifically AI and drug discovery, fintech, and a number of other areas. And uh, happy Thanksgiving for everyone uh, who is viewing us from the United States. Thanks very much, Kate. George. Yeah, uh, my name is George Wang. Uh, I'm the CEO, founder of eBuy International. Uh, this is the company uh, that's focusing on rapid specialty contract manufacturing. We help uh, our institutional uh, clients or individual clients to get their ideas uh, engineered and built and distributed worldwide. So we've been in business for about 21 years and we have operations uh, headquartered here in Portland, Oregon, <clears throat> and then uh, operations in uh, Shanghai, in Shenzhen, Beijing, uh, in uh, India, Vietnam, uh, Singapore, Australia, and also in London. So we have a uh, pretty broad uh, our employee operation company worldwide, helping uh, engineering and build uh, different type of products, get ideas into reality, and then help to ship them worldwide. So that's what we do. Excellent. Um, in addition to serving uh, on the uh, G20 Board of Directors for the World Economic Development Commission for Smart Cities. I also am the vice chairman of an asset management company in Switzerland, Excel Security House and Finance, where I manage a 2 billion euro uh, debt fund for infrastructure in West Africa. And I'm uh, the chief development officer for a Kuwaiti private equity fund called the Illa Holding Group. And uh, we specialize in my area of asset management there and equity management is around the commercialization of advanced technologies. So, Kate, I'm very excited to talk to you about our AI operations and the work that you've done, uh, because we, what we've done is we've commercialized the AI from uh, the Mars rover. Um, and we use it in the oil and gas industry, and we've just started using it in the healthcare industry, uh, as well as the energy industry. Uh, all challenges that we face. Now, um, Kate, if I might start with you, one of the things that really, um, following uh, the introduction of COVID, um, has braced the world is uh, the breakdown in multilateral supply chains. 
And that has had a dramatic impact on, on healthcare provision, on longevity, uh, on a whole host of the areas associ- that we typically associate with life sciences and the health of individuals. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences and uh, some examples of concerns that you have as we start to do planning around the post-COVID uh, new world order? Sure. Well, let me first uh, express my opinion that I think that uh, from its foundation, uh, I don't think UN has faced a bigger challenge. So we're talking 75 years plus, right? And uh, I think uh, 2020 definitely uh, affected all of the UN goals, but specifically health and well-being. Uh, I don't think that the importance of human health has ever been more important. And of course, it brings uh, you know the pros and cons with that. Uh, it is tragic that there was uh, so many uh, people who uh, were affected, uh, dying, as well as being affected uh, otherwise. Uh, however, it also um, brought uh, along some opportunities. For instance, uh, we did see emergence of some uh, technologies, such as uh, telemedicine, for instance, that we were sort of forced to use. And, and I hope that uh, you know it will stay with us and it will uh, continue developing. So that's kind of like a new paradigm that has been uh, less focused on previously, but hopefully it will continue. Uh, well, because we're still in the midst of the pandemic, we cannot quite draw the conclusions. We're still learning from that. Uh, but 2020 was definitely remarkable in terms of in investment uh, in the life sciences sector. Uh, we actually published uh, an article in Market Watch with uh, our founding partner, Dmitry Kaminsky, uh, which was called Health uh, is the New Wealth. Uh, because uh, really the investment in this sector was quite remarkable. Um, you know, there were many, uh, you know, uh, uh, exits, uh, you know, private fundings and all that. So um, this being said, uh, of course, with the uh, necessary focus on COVID, uh, we are yet to embrace the uh, you know, side effects, such as the fact that a lot of the general healthcare issues, including you know preventive healthcare diagnosis, have been um, you know impeded uh, by by the pandemic because we had to focus on that. So um, basically, we have. I mean. I'm glad that uh, everyone is focusing on human health. Um, and uh, it's been very clear that uh, people, older people, as well as people with compromised immune systems were unfortunately the first victims uh, to this terrible disease. And uh, we hope that this would, you know, we, we always wanted to live healthier for longer. If we take United States uh, as an example, and again, we're not talking about anything futuristic, right? So uh, it so happens that uh, our founding partner established a $1 million prize for anyone who lives up to the age of 123 years. The current record is 122. And we actually uh, have a joint database of uh, super centenarians, and there are quite a few people coming closer to this uh, age. However, uh, unfortunately, the last few decades, including even in super centenarians' person's life, you know, it's essentially sick care. In the United States, uh, you know, we spent a lot of um, GDP close to 20% on health care, yet this does not translate compared to other developed Western countries to, you know, either increased lifespan, like, uh, you know, on average, we live close to, you know, men and women combined uh, close to 79.9 years. Uh, but the health span, and this is something that we want to focus, is, ju- is 10 years less. Speaking of uh, Asia Pacific, Singapore spends about 5% of its GDP on healthcare, and then, you know, only three, and they live longer, and it's only the last three years that are the worst. So this is something that we want to focus. We are gl- glad that actually, uh, I think uh, there are more organizations uh, focusing on that as well. So I think that that this uh, shift will help, uh, as well as you know, emergence of uh, new technologies. You know, like including, you know, I mentioned telemedicine, AI. We're always been big, big believers. Uh, so, um, but we're not done yet. So we have, uh, we're yet to see what uh, what happens next. So it's important to focus on the pandemic, uh, you know, as well, as, you know, and continue uh, keeping focus on innovation as well, uh, as well as um, observing the situation in general. Yeah, and one of the one of the interesting challenges, is especially when we look at Asia and Asia Pacific, um, in China, for example, um, prior to COVID, there was a, a massive movement for the expansion of independent and assisted living um, facilities um, because their dynamic has has changed prior to COVID, and children were moving away from 
rural areas and concentrating into cities, um, there was a shift in the lifestyle care for um, a lot of Chinese families. So there was a, a need about a, about a decade ago, it was identified to develop 1,500 uh, medical facilities each year for the next 20 years. That's an enormous infrastructure and construction. And the utilization of AI and robotics for medicine dispensing, for monitoring and for support um, has appropriately also grown dramatically in the planning with it within Asia. Um, and, and you mentioned telehealth, and I, I'm going to shamelessly plug one of our telehealth companies because we provide telehealth between the International Space Station and NASA. Um, it's a great company called VC, and we've done work uh, all around the world, a grassroots company, but um, really uh, they, they have built a foundational technology um, that provides providers the opportunity to integrate with family members and patients in a, a really novel way, uh, building both education and the opportunity for improved health through a social media. Um, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, George, as, as we're looking at um, issues of supply chain, as we're looking at issues of global economies that have come to a halt in multilateral partnerships that have been strained. Um, what, what do you see as uh, the critical components and next steps as we try to emerge from um, the COVID pandemic? And, and we just recently saw that Gibraltar, which is 100% vaccinated, is having a spike in, in increased health issues. So uh, we're, we're clearly not out of the woods with vaccinations and masking and social distancing, at least as, as the cure-all for eradicating COVID, what, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of manufacturing, development, and economic growth? So uh, that's a very uh, good question, especially for me, because we are in the business of uh, uh, contract manufacturing. So we have our India Hyderabad operation, uh, pretty much being since uh, I think that's like a May last year. You know when India had this uh, COVID thing exploded all over the place. Basically, that put the operation in a big trouble. Later on, now it's kind of recovered a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, we have our Vietnam uh, operation. Until today, there's still the factory. They're kind of isolated. You have to live in on on the campus in order not to be uh, drive away by the government because otherwise, you know, they were doing this kind of isolation thing. And we have the manufacturing capacity is kind of on and off, on and off. I think. You know, for the new development, it's almost impossible because we're managing these supply chain. Every product you do, you know, you have to go through many different countries. Now, any one link has prob problem, then mm -hmm. the whole thing is zeroed out. And then, uh, well, luckily in uh, Shenzhen in China, that's the only place to keep the keep the <laughs> the uh, engine running, uh, all these others uh, go stop, go stop. It's really, uh, uh, you know, everyone in India are employees. They all got a COVID, and in Vietnam they're okay. So, right. yeah. <laughs> so uh, in China, so they're the although they are like they do have this uh, uh, extra tariff that put it on twenty five percent, but it's the only one I think is keep the world going. You know. Uh, you know, we had a meeting <laughs> Thanksgiving or thank you for, they have like a one month locked down other, uh, in last year. After that, uh, they had a February lockdown in March. They are all kind of back up running. So to keep the supply going, then we got in this trauma of the the ports issue. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have hundreds of lease of ships being <laughs> parked outside. It took like a extra two months you know, to get anything delivered. So in general, 
because we are managing many companies' supply chain. So for most of electronics product now, it all kind of stopped because they always have the one way or the other some chips is not there. Right. So the electronics industry pretty much is put in a halt. Nothing can be shipped, you know. So uh, this uh, situation is pretty bad, you know. Um, the way of a recovery, I think overall, there could be a twenty percent of, uh, you know, the business loss, just by the supply chain movement. It's right. impossible to move. So, so that's happening right now. That's the reality. <laughs> yeah. So, so let me let me let me ask this, um, because when economies are good, when economies are booming. Um, you, you see lots of reinvestment into um, uh, the culture. You see lots of reinvestment in education and healthcare, generally speaking. When, when things are bad, people start focusing on very concrete things. Um, there are a couple of the um, UN um, SDGs that deal with the eradication of poverty, the eradication of human trafficking and slave trade, the eradication of hunger. Um, as as you both are are looking at your areas, and 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 there are a couple of steps away from those topics specifically. But what do you think the impact is going to be over the next twelve months, five years, decade? Um, as we have to start thinking about. Um, how are we going to address those those goals by you know 2025 2030 um, if the economy is still faltering and and what needs to be done to help the economy if 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 you have ideas it's a challenging question i admit Any, anybody want to jump in and try to tackle that one well it's a challenging question indeed Ted. uh so i will start with a comment and perhaps i'll come up with an answer so well of course, economy was enormously affected with all of the lockdowns and people losing jobs. And, you know, I live in San Francisco and, you know, people were greatly affected uh, by uh, these factors. So it definitely is the area that needs to be addressed. Um, you've mentioned, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, vaccines per se are not, you know, a panacea against, uh, you know, anything given Gibraltar as an example. So I think we're, uh, well, as the pandemic is still unfolding, we're yet to uh, learn a few lessons. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the approaches would be a combined one when we can take a look at uh, various approaches across the globe. Um, it was uh, last year, actually, at the beginning of pandemic, when We'll detour a little bit from our general uh, topic of longevity uh, per se, and we focused on COVID because we thought that this was just, uh, you know, very important. And uh, what we've done, we've um, evaluated 200 countries, so almost everyone in the world, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of their uh, efficacy, in terms of uh, response to COVID. Again, like a lot of things changed since then because there was no vaccines, you know. Uh, so I think... Uh, well, with every month, we know more uh, in terms of uh, how you can successfully uh, manage the pandemic or semi-successful at least so that we will not have major interruptions. So I don't have um, uh, an exact answer other than, you know, looking around and see uh, what is happening around us and learning some lessons um, and, uh, you know, and having a combined approach, to, uh, approach as it applies to a particular country. Well, and, you know, interestingly enough, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, there needs to be collaboration, transparency, and the sharing of information ac across boundaries. And that means across politics, across economies, across global geographies, um, in an effort to be able to provide uh, some simple ish, simple um, ground grounding uh, rules around how we work together as a people, as a global people. Um, George, what, what are your thoughts uh, in terms of um, manufacturing? You mentioned that chips are, are an issue. What about raw materials um, uh, for manufacturing? Um, as, as we're looking at some of the third, fourth, and fifth world countries, uh, many of them which are in Southeast Asia or, or, or parts of China, um, regions, 
uh, their ability to actually extract and ship um, raw materials has dramatically decreased over the last 18 months, which has slowed down the rest of the supply chain because then the intermediaries and the manufacturers uh, can't produce their parts, their component parts can't get to the final assemblers. Um, what, what do you think we need to do to try to um, help abate that issue? Well, uh, to answer, to start with, you know, you talk about the first, your your question earlier. So I think right now uh, from our, you know, uh, operation on the, down to the street, uh, the whole world has suffered drastically, you know, on this COVID, which I think right now uh, is kind of ignored by the politician world, the political world. And all these third world country, the people are getting really poor. They are survival, trying to make their life because it's COVID. But that's all taken over by the geopolitical thing that's got sort of ignored. You nobody talk about that, right? So I think the, uh, the impact of that COVID is, is very bad on, even in China, their contracting economy going down really fast. And same thing with every country, even the U.S., right? So, of course, in the U.S., we have the advantage of getting the U.S. dollar pumped into the economy. That helps on the stock market, but, you know, but for the actual people's uh, uh, life, uh, especially in the third world countries, they don't have that advantage, right? So they really need help, you know, but uh, I think that's kind of a more or less ignored because I, from all the news, you never heard of that part anymore. Everybody talking about the geopolitical thing. They're kind of like charged with that. So the basic need is not being really taken, you know, care of. We do have several programs working with uh, the nonprofit organization that helps to provide build up um, for the orphanage kids, you know, the, the ship to Africa, you know, we got that kind of program going on, but the shipping costs, you know, is going up 10x more. That's big impact to the cost. Right. So, yeah. Kate, and, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please. Yeah. So talking about the uh, uh, the manufacturing from raw material, you know, you look at the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, the stream, right, from the uh, uh, ores to the metal, and then to the uh, uh, raw metal, to the alloy, to the, you know, or from oil to the plastic resins. So usually the first level of these manufacturing are those big steel mills or chemical plants to make the those uh, raw material. And that have been, has a major uh, price increase uh, in the last year or so. That's one big thing. And then, you know, those material build, you know, plastic resins or steels, they ship it around the world, got a secondary process to different countries. All those small countries, none of them have the big steel mill, the, the big chemical plant. Right. They have to import mostly from China because China has all these big plants just at the raw material level, right? So to, to make the raw steel, and or the plastic resins, you know, or in the U.S., U.S. mostly a high-end Europe. So that's uh, uh, the price goes up dramatically, and then uh, then the uh, the power, <laughs> you know, electricity. That's a major problem. And basically, this year you look at that problem is everywhere. So uh, it's for all the business. It's really hard. All the supply chain managers from I know, I know larger companies more, they cannot go sleep anymore because the boss is asking for alternative re- solution. Mm-hmm. You know what? <laughs> These are all compounded, right? You're not having, right. you know, you're having this power problem, the raw material price problem, the oil price problem, labor shortage, the COVID, the, the politics going on, the trade, the logistics. That's why you see more and more the empty shelf. <laughs> yeah, and, yes. even know, in the US. Uh, right. So, yeah. um, wow. Um, uh, this has been a really depressing conversation. 
<laughs> Plus, I just say that's a reality, right? Yeah. So how do right. you even solve this problem? You know, and basically, then the you have to go up to the to the politician or the governor. Right? Then they just walk away, and talk about something else. Yeah, there's this political problem. <laughs> they start focusing on low things, and everything in the real world seems like that's not being really uh, there. No leadership, right? You know, so so that's the reality. And then talking about the UN goal, the COVID, the COVID. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> Even today, the U.S. still have a hundred thousand new infections, right? Yeah. Well, people well, just ignore it. <laughs> one, one of the things that that we see is with the with the pandemic having gone on for so long already, is we have both information overload, and we have emotional fatigue from our citizens, and they're they. They were immediately and constantly barraged with lots of information. A lot of it was conflicting, still lots of conflicting information, Uh, lots of challenging information, and people quite honestly just want to get on with their lives. And I I live in a very global community, and I I do lots of traveling uh, prior to COVID. I, I traveled uh, probably to 20 or 30 countries um, on an annual basis. And if you if you go to the Nordic countries, you know they want to get back to life. You you go to the Mediterranean countries, and while they were initially uh, very uptight, they're tired of it. They they just want to get back to family and uh, work and and life. And the same is true across Asia. Um, any any of the countries I've been in in ASEAN or uh, Singapore or or China, Japan. Um, I see the same thing and it's family are just fatigued. Uh, they're overloaded and they want to move on with life. But how do we move on when we haven't solved the underlying problem of the pandemic? Um, I, and I, again, I, I wish I, I wish we had answers. Uh, but Kate, what, what are you, what are your thoughts? I know we're coming to the close of our session. What, what else do we, do, would you like to say to people? Um, as well, we're, uh, if I may, well, in terms of uh, you know global leadership, leadership like UN uh, does have a number of initiatives. There was a global compreh- comprehensive uh, response for COVID nineteen uh, that started last year, and UN actually uh, paid very prompt attention to the issue. I understand it's not perfect, and we're not you know done. Obviously, uh, there was also a number of uh, other initiatives, uh, whether global or collaborations with countries. If we talk about EU member st- states, I think they uh, gave close to $1 billion to the region. You know, U.S. also contributed vaccines and all that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, despite Thanksgiving, you know, as you mentioned that we're having a somewhat depressing conversation. However, to, bri- to add some bright note, I think that we know more uh, today compared to, uh, you know, uh, March of 2020 when uh, WHO announced the global pandemic. Okay, uh, I think it was a, a remarkable breakthrough that, uh, you know, that vaccines were able to be developed at such fast speed, which was uh, actually unthought of uh, at the uh, at the start of the pandemic. Uh, we also observe uh, different countries, uh, uh, you know, having uh, different outcomes, which would give us some intelligence. Um, my personal opinion uh, is that it is important for us to uh, successfully, to the extent possibly, overcome this. Uh, while living a semi-normal life because it's uh, good for our health. And we're actually, as I mentioned, like, yes, of course, COVID uh, is the top priority, but there are many other, you know, and my focus always is uh, health, right? So, but there are many, you know, health issues that are being overlooked as we speak, be mental health or being lack of diagnosis or treatment or lack of medic- medical personnel. We should not uh, forget about that. Uh, the exact answer uh, is... Uh, known other than I think that innovation is a great path and we've seen successes uh, in that sphere. Um, In terms of, uh, you know, uh, global supply chains, I know George is uh, obviously an expert. I just see the ships standing in San Francisco Bay outside of my window. Uh, So it's all part of the same, 
you know, uh, picture, right? So we're very, you know, we're all interconnected uh, in every way. So starting from health to supply chains, and of course, economy is directly involved in the, uh, you know, trickle down effect of that, because many people are suffering economically as well. Uh, but the root cause of all of the you know, current troubles that we're discussing here is COVID-19. So the most successful approach we can develop in addition to what we have done now uh, would hopefully resolve it. As to what exactly the approach will be, uh, time will tell. Uh, but I know that, you know, scientists are working on, you know, additional therapies. We are also, you know, observing other measures that worked in different countries, which we hopefully will come to some common denominator and see what actually works. Yeah, there, I, I had the good fortune of meeting with a former U.S. Surgeon General who met with the heads of each of the uh, vaccine companies every Saturday morning oh. uh, for updates and for to, to find out what obstacles needed to be removed to allow them to grow and develop um, potential solutions. And the interesting thing, and I, I'm, I'm going to draw on something that you said, innovation education and a commitment to just living your life is critical. And that's at all levels. Um, and anything that we can do as leaders, as thought leaders, as entrepreneurs, as financiers that can help drive that, that can help support innovation, the adoption um, in the United States, we removed many barriers to allow telehealth um, to be able to take care of the pent up demand for enormous healthcare issues. Um, and that's been a, a dramatic and, and wonderful improvement. Um, and it happened because we experienced the pandemic. Um, George, as, as you're thinking about concluding remarks um, regarding supply chain and manufacturing, what, what would you like to see over the next 12 months? And what's, what's most important from your perspective that we begin to address? Well, uh, because you know, because we are dealing with the real world, we're facing the reality. That's why it's kind of depressing, you know. For other people, they're not talking. They're not talking about the reality. Of course, they can be this and that. But the, overall, I think the uh, the prosperity period pre COVID is take a big deep down now. So we're at a kind of a state of uh, trying to start to survive again, you know, try to make a, a way, find a way. In the bigger picture, it's a chaos, right? From politics, to geopolitics, everything now is a really big shattering effects. Now, as an individual or a smaller organization, what can we do in this type of situation, right? So which I think that's back to the basic, you know, get to get one thing done, help one person, it's always good, you know. So that's all we can do <laughs> in uh, in this type of uh, situation in our day to day life. Let's try to fight, solve the problem, one problem at a time, you know, because the big thing we cannot control. So, I I think that's really wise wise advice. Um, I, I actually spent time in manufacturing and aerospace and defense, and I, I often liken that to being a middle school principal. Um, and look at, looking at pulling people with divergent needs um, and wants all together for a common good. Um, the pandemic has been probably one of the single most disruptive events in the, the last century. Um, we have climate change issues, uh, arguably around the world, that are impacting uh, areas uh, you know, here in the United States, we may not see it quite as directly as some of the islands that are disappearing, um, uh, of the feet and yards that are disappearing from our polar caps. Um, and then when we see uh, the issues around um, COVID-19 injections and vaccinations that are are losing their ability to address um, COVID because the success factor uh, is going in some of these from 64% to 46% to 19% over time. And part of that is, is variance. And part of it is the, the shifting um, structure 
of the the virus, um, a lot like influenza, um, requires constant attention. And as we're looking as a global health system, as global manufacturers, as uh, global supply chains, we, we need to be thinking about how it is we can address those issues and develop the next generation. Um, uh, Kate, George, and I are a little older than you, but um, we, we are... Much older. <laughs> Probably not, but, I will, I will, but don't ask me. You, this is you, you, My you age is confidential. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to comment, and I'm going to apologize for being no ages worries. because I'm, I'm the oldest in the group. Um, uh, but, you know, there needs to be this development of the, the next global thought leaders. And, um, you know, the types of experiences that Kate, you've had and that George, you've had that have helped shape you um, are, are profound and they're global. And um, but you've also done enormous amounts of research. You've been through education and training and there's a, an entire new generation coming up where. Um, a lot of their education is through YouTube and social media, and it's in two-minute snippets. And and I, that causes me a little bit of concern because I see that movement in China as well, uh, where the average person has four cell phones. Um, I still have one. So. <laughs> I, I have I have two, but I work for <laughs> uh, for a better one. <laughs> <My blue> one. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I have one for outside of the United States and one inside the United States, but I, I work for somebody who has six. Um, he has one essentially for every continent that we do business on. Um, and they're constantly ringing. So it's, um, we're, we're, we're coming to the, the close of our, our session. Um, but I wanted to just give you um, just a, a last moment of anything that you'd like to address. Um, and first, I want to thank you, Kate, George. You guys are amazing people. Uh, your thoughts today, but also the contributions you've made outside of um, this conference are phenomenal. And we look to see great things to continue to come from you. So, uh, Kate, if there's something you'd like to add in closing. Well, Deb, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words. It's been a pleasure uh, to meet you and George. And you are doing uh, pretty amazing work yourself. Um, I really uh, like your comments about, uh, you know, the fact that you know, we can do common good. And uh, also you mentioned uh, social media. So for us, uh, our group has been producing open access analytics. And I want to emphasize open access because we don't charge for that. Uh, and we've been doing this, uh, well, since 2015, mostly focused on longevity, but we also have uh, analytics that focuses on COVID. And um, again, we have a number of parameters and this is, uh, again, work in progress. So we are always happy to, you know, uh, get comments, feedback uh, and, and all of that. Uh, so hopefully uh, if anyone wants to uh, go check it out at uh, dkv.global uh, and there is COVID analytics there, perhaps it will uh, give additional ideas to you know, governments, nonprofits, companies, et cetera, uh, you know, to contribute to uh, resolving this global crisis, because obviously this is something that needs to be done. Uh, and uh, of course, always open for, you know, conversations, collaborations, and uh, it's a privilege to be a part of this discussion. Thank you very much. And George, please. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Ted. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I also, Kate, very nice to meet you. <clears throat> so uh, my, uh, uh conclusion statements would be yeah i think on a very positive side at least if each person can have three shots of the uh, vaccine and now they're the uh even for the people who got covid can they have the special medicine now so the death rate is low hopefully i think the immediate goal would be how to help the seven billion people, each person got a th three shot and then open up the world because otherwise people are dying anyway, is you would die one way or the other. <laughs> so so with after that, then we can work and try to rebuild the prosperity to the best the level. So uh, that's, uh, that's with some <laughs> tangible I, goal. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, I, First of all, I'd like to thank those folks who have um, joined us during the course of our, our talk today, but also those that will watch the streaming after 
after the show because it's it's very late in some areas and it's very early in others. Um, uh, from the United States, we have uh, Kate and George who have shared their thoughts on the pandemic, the eradication of the pandemic, and the impact on uh, major strategic initiatives to include the United Nations 17 strategic goals. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and let us let everyone know that uh, these conferences put on by Horasis are, are fabulous and there are many of them throughout the world. Please take a look at the website. Um, be sure to check out Kate's website at dkv.global. I get that right? Excellent. And um, be sure to reach out to us through LinkedIn or other social media avenues um, because everyone here is very collaborative and we look forward to seeing how we might be able to work with you. All right, folks, thanks very much. And Thank you. We'll, we'll turn Thank it back. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.